So the next uh, lecture is going to cover, um, again, just some foundational set theory concepts and talk about events and how they relate uh, to risk analysis. So some objectives for this, um, this presentation. One is we want to be able to, just, to talk about events, talk about um, relationships between the events that make up a risk assessment. And one of the ways we can do that is using um, set theory. The other thing that can be really helpful in a risk analysis is to um, have um, a visual depiction of events and how they relate to one another in a risk analysis. And we can do that with Venn diagrams. So that's something we're going to cover in this presentation. And then um, in terms of things that, that you're actually going to do somewhat routinely in risk analysis is understanding um, the difference between combinations and permutations and how to um, count them, how to identify how many there are, and uh, from that, how to list them so that we can make sure we include all the ones um, that are relevant for our risk analysis. So as an outline, we're going to cover uh, just a rough introduction to set theory, uh, a little bit about Venn diagrams, a little bit about set operations that help us relate events to each other, and then we'll transition into how that relates to um, uh, things in the in the world of, uh, in the space of probability, and then we'll wrap up with some uh, some overview and some examples on um, combinations and permutations. So, what is set theory? So, uh, formal definition of set theory would be that it's a, a branch of math. Um, covers mathematical logic and it deals with the properties of sets. And so what are sets? Sets are basically um, a collection of things, right? They can be events, uh, which is typically what we're doing in, uh, in risk analysis, right? We're interested in a collection of different events that um, come together to, um, to generate the risk at our, at our dam or levy. Um, now we're not going to do a deep dive into set theory. Um, this, you know, and this is a college level course in and of itself. Um, but it does give us a little bit of a foundation, um, at least in some of the concepts. And, you know, you, you'll find, um, if you're like me, you'll find this useful. I still, just last week, we were going over um, some external peer review comments on a, a new piece of software we're developing called RMC Total Risk for doing um, risk calculations. And we were sketching out some of entries to kind of sort through some of the some of the understandings of what we're doing in total risk and some of the external comments we got. So um, I think you'll find this is at least one of the tools you can put in, in your toolbox that you in your toolbox that you'll find useful. So it is a foundational concept for risk analysis. And the what's going to be presented here today is there's there's different there's different um systems and different um sets of rules for set theory that have you know various folks have proposed. Uh, the most common one probably is called the ZFC system, and it's named after um, the person who came up with it, so Zermelo Frankel. Um, plus um, one additional axiom that he came up with called the axiom of choice. And again, we're not going to go over that in great detail, but it's just useful to know that the system that most folks use is based on this ZFC system for set theory. So as I mentioned before, a set is a collection of objects or events. Um, the objects that exist within a set, we call them elements. And when we're doing risk analysis, we're typically talk, talking about events, right? So, you know, a flood happens, the levee overtops, um, flood damages occur, right? Wh whatever it might be, right? Uh, there's a, you know, a flaw exists in the foundation of the dam. Um, we usually talk about these discrete events and those are the elements um, that make up our, our, um, our set. So these events are the building blocks of any risk analysis. And again, oftentimes we're talking about um, decomposing the thing we're interested in, which is usually going to be, you know, failure of the dam or levy and decomposing that into a sequence of a, of a more manageable kind of bite-sized pieces of events 
um, that collectively could lead to a failure. There's different ways we can describe these events. We can describe them categorically. So um, they fit into one category or another. So for example, the levy fails or the levy doesn't fail would be an example of um, a category for an event. Or you can define events um, by a quantitative number. So in this example here, peak stage in the reservoir is 10 feet. Is It would be a specific event that you could define and describe with the numerical value. And then we can also describe, and we always do in risk analysis, you can describe events by probability. So you can take the either the categorical or the numerical description of the event and put a probability with it to give you two pieces of information that go into a risk analysis, right? How, what's the magnitude of the thing in this case, peak stage, and what's the likelihood of that happening in this case? Um, uh, 0.1 probability or, or 10%. Venn diagrams are next. So Venn diagrams are um, the most common way to, to draw, essentially draw a picture of the events and, and what they look like relative to each other. So again, it's just, um, if you're an engineer, you can think of the Venn diagram as the free body diagram of probability and statistics if, if you for those that are engineers in the audience, right? You remember you learned free body diagrams in engineering mechanics. You can think of Venn diagrams as uh, the equivalent, something roughly equivalent for probability and statistics. The, the way we draw Venn diagrams, usually they're, they're depicted um, with a base shape of a rectangle, but that's not mandatory. That's just kind of standard practice. Um, so the collection of all the possible events that could occur or all the possible items that could be in the set. It's called the sample space. And again, we usually draw that as a rectangle. And then individual um, elements or events in our case, we usually draw as either overlapping or non-overlapping closed shapes. You know, circles are pretty common, but they could be any shape, circle, squares, whatever, whatever your favorite shape is. Uh, but the idea is just we draw them and how we how we draw them in terms of um, whether or not they overlap other events tells us something about how those events relate to one another. There's different operations we can use on the events within a set, and this is kind of the, this kind of lays the foundation for operations that we routinely use in risk analysis for um, how we calculate probabilities and how we um, combine probabilities across a collection of events in our risk analysis. So I'll talk about just a, a few, um, few, of the, few of the important concepts and a few of the important terms in um, relationships between events that you'll commonly see in risk analysis. So the first is collectively exhaustive. Um, that basically means that we've covered all of the possible events. So we've essentially exhausted all of the possibilities. Um, this is really important in a risk analysis, particularly when you're building risk models and things like event trees. You want to make sure you don't leave anything uh, that's important out of the risk analysis. So you want to make sure you've covered all the possibilities. So in this example here, we have just a really simple case um, where either flooding occurs this year or flooding does not occur this year. Right? Those are the only two things that could happen in this little simple example. So those two events represent a set of collectively exhaustive events, which means that we've covered all of the uh, possibilities. So what does that mean in terms of um, risk analysis? So when we have a set of collectively exhaustive events, at least one of them has to occur. So that means this year, either flooding has to occur or no flooding has to occur, right? One of those has to happen. And um, the other thing we'll, we'll see more on later in terms of probabilities is that the probabilities of those two events have to sum up to one because they cover all the things that could occur. So again, um, the key concept here for risk analysis is that we want to make sure we don't um, overlook any of the important events that could, um, could uh, drive our risk estimate. Next one is mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive means um, that two events cannot occur at the same time or in the same event. So a simple example here is that you have a, a dam with two spillway gates and 
you know, you want to know how many, how many gates, um, or different numbers of gates that could fail. So you could have one gate fails, or you could have both gates fail. Um, but both of those events can't happen together, right? So you can't have one gate failing and two gates failing, right? It has to be one or the other. Um, so if you had an earthquake event, right, you're going to see one of these events. And then the, the rest of the, the, the blank part of the sample space here, right, would be, I don't have it labeled here, but it would be representative of zero gates failing, right? So if you only have two spillway gates, either one fails, they both fail, or neither of them fail. So this interaction, or in this case, uh, lack thereof, right? There's no overlap between these events. So uh, because they're mutually exclusive, they don't overlap. Um, that affects how we estimate their probabilities and how we would combine those probabilities in a, in a risk estimate. Um, and we'll see more on that later. So there's always some some practicality, right? If you're uh, if you're in the world of engineering, um, there's always a practical element of making um, model simplifications when it's appropriate to do so. So there's lots of applications where we um, where events are so close to being mutually exclusive that in our risk model we just assume that to be true. So here's an example here where you have um, a coincident flood and earthquake happening at the same time, um, which is really rare. Although if you've seen the news uh, over the last few weeks in Southern California, they had a um, tropical storm go through. And while the tropical storm was passing over Southern California, they had a magnitude five earthquake. So, um, so it's not impossible, but it's, um, usually pretty unlikely, and it usually is not a significant contributor um, to the risk of a dam or a levee. So oftentimes in practice, we will just assume floods and earthquakes are uh, mutually exclusive because it simplifies the risk model. And it um, has, in most, not every case, but in most cases, barely has any effect on the risk estimate. And the reason is because the probability of both occurring at the same time is usually incredibly small. Okay, the next type of relationship between events we'll cover is complement. So complementary events, um, there's different notations. Apostrophe is one of the notations you'll see. That notation basically means not. So it's um, complement basically refers to um, an event that does not occur. And it's usually, you know, in reference to, um, you know, the other event, or, or the, I guess the, literally the complement would be the event occurring. So uh, a property of complementary events is by definition, they're mutually exclusive, right? So you can't have both something occur and not occur at the same time, and they're collectively exhaustive, right? Either it occurs or it doesn't. So that provides some nice properties that leads to some common shortcuts that we use in our risk models and calculations. And this is one of them, probably the most common one. So for example, if you want to calculate the probability of a levy not failing, you can simply calculate that as one minus the probability of the levy failing. Or in this case, the levy probability of the levy not overtopping is always going to be one minus the probability of the levy overtopping. And um, we'll see later on when we get into some of the probability lectures that this is a far easier way to calculate this number than trying to um, do it explicitly. So this is sort of a, I guess, a shortcut of sorts. It uh, allows us to uh, do the calculations much easier. All right, intersection of events. So this is really important when we when we decompose um, failure modes into a sequence of events. Uh, intersection means that um, both events, or if you have more than two events, all the events occur. So again, when we're talking about failure modes, we talk about a sequence of events. All of all of those events have to occur in some sequence to lead to a failure of the dam or levee. So when we talk about that, we're talking about the intersection of, of that sequence of events. 
on a Venn diagram, um, the intersection is represents where those um, events overlap each other. The symbol we use uh, for intersections is it looks like an upside down U. That symbol means and. So one way to keep track of intersection is just remember intersection means and. So it means uh, the two events occur. So in this case, a person does not evacuate and the flood depth at their location is greater than two feet. Might be something that would impact um, the magnitude of or the potential for life loss uh, in this simple example. Uh, but again, the key is to remember that intersection means and. Union, again, another common thing we use in risk analysis. So union, you can think of as meaning or. So the symbol, it's not exactly a U, but it looks a lot like a U, uh, U for union. Um, but just remember that union means or. So what union means is that at least one of the events occurs. So the scenario here is that the union is defined by um, the region that covers all the events. So it covers uh, each event, and then it also covers over any overlapping area uh, between the events. Um, so in risk analysis, this is commonly where we um, arrive at a total risk estimate for a dam or a levy, because the risk comes from failure due to multiple failure modes. In this case, you could have monolith sliding or backward erosion piping, or both um, could happen. So uh, union is generally how we combine um, individual failure modes in order to get an estimate of the total probability of failure or the total risk estimate. Uh, and there's, we'll see when we cover risk analysis at the end of the course, there's different, different ways to um, think about and model union in a, in a risk calculation. So probability space, we can use Venn diagrams to kind of um, scale things to probabilities and get a visual of how likely things are relative to other, other events. So again, a really simple example here, but the relative um, size of the shape that represents an event in your Venn diagram uh, can be drawn proportional to its probability. So if, if the total sample space, this, this rectangle, um, has to represent a probability of one, we can scale the size of, um, of this event where beach erosion occurs uh, based on its probability. So in this case, again, just a simple example, if the probability of beach erosion is one out of three or 33%, then we can draw the circle of a size so that it takes up 33% of that rectangle. And so it's, it's kind of trivial in this example with only one event, but when you start drawing multiple events together and, how they relate to each other and you know whether or not they overlap with each other you can you can kind of get a really quick visual for the relative likelihood of things um, one example of that is you know i talked about the before the idea of assuming floods and earthquakes are mutually exclusive you could actually draw that venn diagram to scale and you could draw the overlapping area to scale based on the probability and you would quickly visually see that that likelihood of a coincident flood and earthquake is, you know, vanishingly small, such that, you know, you would feel comfortable leaving it out of your risk analysis. So you can do things like that that just give you some visual cues. Sometimes it's useful too when presenting um, presenting results of a risk analysis, right? In terms of making the case, these diagrams can provide really simple visual cues um, in terms of how these events relate to each other and, and how likely they are. All right, we'll cover combinations and uh, permutations next. Um, the big difference between combinations and permutations is uh, basically depends on whether or not the ordering matters. So when it comes to combinations, um, combinations involve a selection of events from our sample space when we don't care about the order in which the events occur. So, uh, for example, if we're talking about, again, maybe something like spillway gates on a dam, um, and we're interested in how many spillway gates might fail uh, during a flood event, we might only be interested in the number of gates that fail and not necessarily what, what specific gates fail and in what order they fail. 
So in this case, we'd be more interested in the combinations that could occur. Um, the basic equation for calculating the number of com combinations is the binomial coefficient. And that formula is there, shown there on the right. It's basically, um, you calculate the number of combinations given uh, n items taken k at a time. And so that basically means if we had, you know, something like three spillway gates and we want to take and look at combinations for uh, taking two failures out of three spillway gates, we can plug that into the binomial coefficient and get the number of combinations. The Hopefully everyone remembers from math, but the exclamation point there just means factorial. And the formula is there for how factorials are calculated as a refresher. Um, and then you can do this in Excel or, or lots of other software packages, but the, the built-in function in Excel, if you want to do the bi, uh, binomial co coefficient is the combin um, function, which basically stands for combination. Another uh, way to visualize combinations is with Pascal's triangle. So all Pascal's triangle is, and there's you'll if you look it up online, you'll see thousands of different varieties of it. Um, but it's basically just a way to visually look at um, the binomial coefficient. Um, so example here shown on the right hand side, where um, the column you're in, uh, it would be column K. So that's your k value, and you would calculate it um, from zero to n. And the row, uh, the row going from top to bottom is your n value, and it goes, you know, starts at, at row zero at the top, and theoretically it can go all the way down to an infinite number of rows. So if you know what your n and your k value are, you can uh, you can look them up just graphically in this. Uh, Depiction. I think we'll see an example here on the next slide of this, and you can um, get the number of combinations. The unique, uh, interesting property about, about this triangle is you can build it by hand without having to memorize the formula here. And the way you build it is that in a given location, let's let's look at this this number. Uh, let's look at this one here. This uh, hopefully you can see my cursor. Everyone see my cursor? Yes. So this three, this three here, um, is calculated by summing the two connected uh, ones above it. So one plus two gives you three. Same thing when you're down here at four. Four comes from three plus one. So you could start at the here at the top one, since it's only one. These two are both ones, and then this is a one because it only touches one. This is two because it touches one and one. So one plus one is two, and this one only touches the one, right? And you can just work your way from top to bottom and build this manually without having to memorize um, the formula. But software will do the calculations for you, so you don't have to memorize it anyway. All right, here's a quick example. So I mentioned an example here where you have a, a dam with three spillway gates, and you want to look at how many combinations are there, how many ways can I have two gates fail if I don't care uh, the order in which they fail. I just care care the number that fail. So in this case, you can plug in n equals three, k equals two, um, or in this case, you can go to um, you can go to the um, you can go to the third row. So you start at zero, zero, one, two, three, third row, and the second column starting at the first column is column zero, right? So this, so we would start here. We would have um, row zero, row one, row two, row three, and then um, this one here on the far left is um, column zero, column one, column two. So that would give us the number of combinations of three. Or you can plug it in the plug it in the formula here. Um, you know, three factorial is uh, three times two times one, which is six, right? Two factorial is um, two times one, which is two. Three minus two is one. One factorial is just one. So you end up with six divided by two, which gives you three, right? And then you can, you know, once you know how many they are, there are, 
Uh, and we don't cover it in this class, but, you know, when you get into large number of combinations, there's little algorithms and routines you can do to basically enumerate or essentially list all the combinations. Um, here in this simple case, you can just kind of manually do it. Uh, and you can look at your, the, the three different ways uh, in terms of combinations in which two gates can fail, right? Gate one and two, gate one and three, or gate two and three. And again, you know, if the number of combinations is relatively small. It's pretty trivial just to work it out manually. All right, so next we want to cover permutations. So what's a permutation? So permutation is also about um, collections of events, but in a permutation, the order in which they occur is matters or is relevant to the risk analysis. So there's two general categories uh, that you can look at for permutations um, with replacement and without replacement. So with replacement means you can have repeats. So in other words, uh, events can be selected more than once. Um, we typically don't see that in risk analysis because um, the events we're talking about, let's say it's a failure mode, right? We usually aren't going to have repeats of a failure mode, a gate failure, whatever it might be in the same, same, say, flood or seismic events. So we usually don't have applications where we worry about the with replacement scenario. Uh, mostly in risk analysis, if we have permutations, we're doing permutations without replacement. It basically means you're not allowed to have any repeats. Uh, each event can only be selected one time. So this can be useful in, uh, in a risk analysis um, when maybe your consequences depend on which failure mode happens first. Maybe, um, you know, maybe you have two failure modes that have different consequences and your total consequences might depend on what order they happen in. Um, so sometimes that might come up as a, as an application in risk analysis. Uh, general formula here for permutations um, for the case of no replacement. Um, so if you have R items um, from a collection of size N, um, again you see the factorial formula in there, but this gives you give you a simple way to calculate how many permutations you should have, so that when you go and list them all for your risk analysis. Um, you make sure you capture them all. And again, this is this is a common thing with combinations and permutations. It's really easy in risk analysis to forget one, miss one, overlook one, not count them correctly, and it can have implications for your risk estimates. So um, when you're dealing with this kind of things, it's it's good to kind of use these as ways to check to make sure you haven't missed anything. Um, so here's an example of permutation without repetition. So this is a, an example of a river system where we have three levees at different locations within the river system. And we want to look at how many different ways um, can, can two of those levees fail. In this example, we're going to assume that the, the order that they fail matters, so which, which levee system fails first. Is relevant for some reason in our risk analysis. Maybe it, um, maybe the consequences are different. Maybe, um, you know, if one levy fails, it changes. Uh, you know, maybe on one side of the river, maybe it makes it less likely that the levy on the other side of the river is going to overtop or or some something along those lines. So the ordering matters in this case, um, but only for the failures. So just to keep it simple, we're going to assume that you know the non-failure, the ordering for the non-failure. Um, outcomes um, doesn't matter for our risk assessment. So we can look at how do we how do we figure out the permutations here again? We just use our simple formula here. So if we have two levy failures um, from a collection of three levies, uh, we can plug that into our formula. And again, three factorial is six. Three minus two is one. One factorial is one. So we get six divided by one or six permutations. You can see them. The shaded ones listed here in the table on the right hand side. Um, and you could do the same thing uh, using this formula for um, the number of permutations for one levy failure and the number of permutations for three levy failures. So you got to remember, right, we, we might be interested in one, two, or three levy failures and all the different ways, considering the ordering, that those could happen. And you can see, even with this simple example, you quickly get 16. Um, permutations. So the number of combinations and particularly number of permutations can uh, grow 
very rapidly in a risk analysis. Um, and it's I've seen many, many cases where folks try to do this by judgment um, without actually listing them out. And oftentimes they miss some of the permutations. So it's, again, it's kind of important, at least on the front end to kind of lay these out if, if you have a situation like this to make sure you haven't missed any. And then what we'll, what we'll often do in, in practice in risk analysis, and this is another one of those practical simplifying assumptions, is we, we may look at some of these um, permutations and we might say, well, you know, for some of these, the likelihood is so low that it's probably not going to contribute much to the risk or the, the consequences are similar enough that, you know, maybe we can, you know, merge some of these together. And so it ends up being an exercise of kind of deliber making deliberate simplifications um, in your risk model to reduce the, reduce the number of um, scenarios that you have to include in your risk model. And again, there's lots of different ways and, and reasons to do that. Um, and oftentimes it's either because we think it's the risk is going to be so low that we can exclude it or that, you know, maybe, 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 you know, some of these three failure combinations, the, the consequences are similar enough that we can, you know, we're just going to simplify things and assume they're the same and merge them into one, one scenario. Um, so that's, uh, that's permutations. Does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts on on some of this um, some of this foundational material? Now, again, this you know this half hour lecture is not going to make you an expert in set theory, but hopefully, at least um, gives you some things to think about and some uh, some tools in the toolbox that you can refer back to as you're doing uh, as you're doing risk analysis. Good morning. Okay. I, I would like to offer a comment. Sure. I had uh, an interesting experience participating as a subject matter expert in an SQRA a couple of years ago, and it was for an agency that had 14 flood control and water conservation uh, facilities, and we were looking at one of them. And of course, with the knowledge that we have coming from atmospheric river phenomena, uh, such as Hillary just provided in Southern California, that is a really interesting and complex issue of what about cascading effects when all of your facilities are in the same collection of watersheds such that uh, they get impacted by the same uh, natural event. Very interesting and challenging thought. Yeah, for sure. So that's a that's a really good topic. Uh, maybe I'll just share a couple quick thoughts on it. Um, we're not going to go into some of these details, but, you know, at least in the Corps of Engineers, generally, um, we manage our portfolio um, dam by dam. So, and our, our tolerable risk guidelines, which basically guide our decisions on what actions to take at, at dams and levees are generally um, written around a risk estimate for an individual dam. So oftentimes our risk assessments uh, and decisions are set up that way. However, as you, as you pointed out, there are definitely lots of places where um, we ought to at least be thinking about things as a system, right? So you have, you know, a scenario like this where maybe, you know, all of these flood control facilities are vulnerable to, you know, one big atmospheric river event, right? So that if, if you know, the, the rare event does happen, it's going to happen to all of them at the same time, right? So potentially your consequences from, you know, a worst case single flood hazard event could be uh, much higher than you might otherwise think if you only looked at each dam individually, right? Um, one of the ways we've we've thought about and used system risk concepts in in the core, I think the Bureau of Reclamation does something similar. Is in terms of um, using it to kind of help um, prioritize over a portfolio, right? So if if you like your your example of the fourteen flood control facilities, 
if you looked at risk from a system perspective, that might guide you in terms of, you know, where to make investments first, um, maybe where to avoid investments, because, you know, an, an investment at one dam could impact potentially the risk at another dam, right? So the sequencing of, of investments, I think, is very relevant when you talk about looking at risk from a system standpoint. but. But also for sure, I think the, the example you gave is a good one where, you know, you have to be careful because if if those events are all um, likely to happen together, then your your consequences could be much more catastrophic than you might otherwise think they could be. So I don't know if that helps, but those are just some thoughts that come to mind on that topic. Very important topic, very relevant uh, for risk analysis. We covered all these concepts in the lecture, right? So mutually exclusive events, right? So mutually exclusive definition just means that the two events can't occur at the same time. It means there's no overlap. There's no intersection. Um, they won't overlap on the Venn diagram and the probability of both occurring is zero, right? We'll see some of those concepts play out later in the week when we go over probability things. But um, again, key concept uh, when we choose how to model events is deciding, right? Are we gonna assume they're mutually exclusive, independent, or dependent, or some other options that we'll cover later. Um, one of those options is mutually exclusive. Some things are just naturally mutually exclusive, and some things are um, close enough to being mutually exclusive that we can make a simplifying assumption and treat them as if they were mutually exclusive in our risk model. So the answer for that one is false. Um, number two, which of the following set operations describes two or more events both occurring? So um, the key thing to remember here um, is complement means not, union means, essentially means or, and intersection means and. So both events occurring is an and condition, right? Uh, both event A and B occur. Um, so when we're talking about things that are an and condition, um, we want to Think of that as being the intersection. And again, we use this often in risk analysis when decomposing things like failure modes into a sequence of events. When we get when we want to get the probability of failure for that failure mode, it's the intersection of all the events that make up that failure mode. And that's where the, the risk calculations stem from, is this concept of intersection. So D would be the answer for number two. Um, and it's, it's easy, I think, we'll see it when we get to number five. Intersection and, and union are easy to mix up. So just remember, intersection is and, and union is or. Okay, so number three. Uh, number three, which of the following events describes the complement? So remember, complement means not. So if you're describing an event and you want the complement, you literally can just insert the word not most of the time, and that will give you the complement. So in this case, Complement of levy overtopping is the levy not overtopping. So again, in risk analysis, we use this to um, derive, you know, for lack of a better word, just call it calculation shortcuts, right? To make it easier to do some of the some of the risk calculations. And one of the common ones is, you know, we can calculate the probability of not failing as one minus the probability of failing. Um, and those two events are the complement of each other. So again, complement means not. Combinations can be counted using binomial coefficient or Pascal's triangle, that's number four. So um, the answer to that is true. So again, the difference between combinations and permutations to remember is with combinations, um, we don't care the order, right? We just care what happens, not the order in which it happens. And that's binomial or Pascal's triangle. And then just remember the permutations is when we care about the ordering of things. And that's how you'll be able to keep those two uh, separate in your mind. And, you know, again, oftentimes, like with combinations, you know, the classic example would be, you know, maybe monoliths or spillway gates subjected to, you know, a seismic loading. And you want to know all you care about is. How many fail, right? You don't care about what order they fail in, right? So you think, well, how many ways can two monoliths fail, right? Or whatever it might be for your risk analysis. 
And then, uh, so the correct answer there is uh, A, true. And then last one, number five, which of the following set operations describes a storm surge either with or without uh, wave runup? So again, when, when things sound like or, or when you explicitly see or in there, that's usually gonna be union. Remember union is or, intersection is and. So in this case, uh, with or without, so the keyword is or. So it could be storm surge by itself, it could be wave run up by itself, or it could be both. So those kind of or conditions are union. And again, um, just another one of the ways that um, how we describe that relationship determines how we're gonna calculate uh, the numbers in our risk analysis. So for unions, um, usually the common application is getting a total, say a total risk estimate for a dam or levy that has multiple ferry modes. We're usually gonna calculate that as the um, union of those ferry modes. And again, we'll see later in the week, there's different ways to, to apply that in practice. But bottom line, just remember union means or. Uh, and that's it.